Tired out but proud, the animals walked round and round their masterpiece, which appeared even more beautiful in their eyes than when it had been built the first time. Moreover, the walls were twice as thick as before. Nothing short of explosives would lay them low this time. And when they thought of how they had labored, what discouragements they had overcome, and the enormous difference that would be made in their lives when the sails were turning and thy dynamos running, when they thought of all this, their tiredness forsook them, and they gambled round and round the windmill, uttering cries of triumph. Napoleon himself, attended by his dogs and his cockerel, came down to inspect the completed work. He personally congratulated the animals on their achievement and announced that the mill would be named Napoleon Mill. Two days later, the animals were called together for a special meeting in the barn. They were struck dumb with surprise when Napoleon announced that they had sold the pile of timber to Frederick. Tomorrow, Frederick's wagons would arrive and begin carting it away. Throughout the whole period of his seeming friendship with Pilkington, Napoleon had really been in secret agreement with Frederick. All relations with Foxwood had been broken off. Insulting messages had been sent to Pilkington. The Pilgins had been told to avoid Pinchfield Farm and to alter their slogan from death to Frederick to death to Pilkington. At the same time, Napoleon assured the animals that the stories of an impending attack on Animal Farm were completely untrue and that the tales about Frederick's cruelty to his own animals had been greatly exaggerated. All these rumors had probably originated with Snowball and his agents. It now appeared that Snowball was not, after all, hiding on Pinchfield Farm, and in fact had never been there in his life. He was living, in considerable luxury, so it was said, at Foxwood, and had in reality been a pensioner of Pilkington for years past. The pigs were in ecstasies over Napoleon's cunning. By seeming to be friendly with Pilkington, he had forced Frederick to rise his price by 12 pounds. But the superior quality of Napoleon's mind, said Squealer, was shown in the fact that he trusted nobody, not even Frederick. Frederick had wanted to pay for the timber with something called a check, which it seemed was a piece of paper with a promise to pay written upon it. But Napoleon was too clever for him. He had demanded payment in real five-pound notes, which were to be handed over before the timber was removed. Already, Frederick had paid up, and the sum he had paid was just enough to buy the machinery for the windmill. Meanwhile, the timber was being carted away at high speed. When it was all gone, another special meeting was held in the barn for the animals to inspect Frederick's banknotes. Smiling beautifully and wearing both his decorations, Napoleon reposed on a bed of straw on the platform, with money at his side neatly piled on a china dish from the farmhouse kitchen. The animals filed slowly past, and each gazed his fill, and Boxer put out his nose to sniff at the banknotes, and the flimsy white thing stirred and rustled in his breath. Three days later, there was a terrible hullabaloo. Whimper, his face deadly pale, came right racing up the path on his bicycle, flung it down into the yard, and rushed straight into the farmhouse. The next moment, a choking roar of rage sounded from Napoleon's apartments. The news of what had happened sped around the farm like wildfire. The bank notes were forgeries. Frederick had got the timber for nothing. Napoleon called the animals together immediately, in a terrible voice pronounced the death sentence upon Frederick. When captured, he said Frederick should be boiled alive. At the same time, he warned them that after this treacherous deed, the worst was to be expected. Frederick and his men might make their long-expected attack at any moment. Sentinels were placed at all the approaches to the farm. In addition, four pigeons were sent to Foxwood with a conciliatory message, which it was hoped might establish good relations with Pilkington. The very next morning, the attack came. The animals were at breakfast when the lookouts came racing in with the news that Frederick and his followers had already come through the five-barred gate. Boldly enough, the animals sallied forth to meet them, but this time they did not have the easy victory that they had had in the Battle of the Cowshed. There were 15 men with half a dozen guns between them, 
and they opened fire as soon as they got within 50 yards. The animals could not face the terrible explosions and the stinging pellets, and in spite of the efforts of Napoleon Boxer to rally them, they were soon driven back. A number of them were already wounded. They took refuge in the farm buildings and peeped cautiously out from chinks and knot holes. The whole of the big pasture, including the windmill, was in the hands of the enemy. For the moment, even Napoleon seemed at a loss. He paced up and down without a word, his tail rigid and twitching. Wistful glances were sent in the direction of Foxwood. If Pilkington and his men would help them, the day might yet be won. But at this moment, the four pigeons, who had been sent out on the day before, returned, one of them bearing a scrap of paper from Pilkington. On it was penciled the words, Serves you right. Meanwhile, Frederick and his men had halted about the windmill. The animals watched them, and a murmur of dismay went round. Two of the men had produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock the windmill down. Impossible, cried Napoleon. We have built the walls far too thick for that. They could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades. But Benjamin was watching the movements of the men intently. The two with the hammer and the crowbar were drilling a hole near the base of the windmill. Slowly, and with an air almost of amusement, Benjamin nodded his long muzzle. I thought so, he said. Do you not see what they are doing? In another moment, they are going to pack blasting powder into that hole. Terrified, the animals waited. It was impossible now to venture out of the shelter of the buildings. After a few minutes, the men were seen to be running in all directions. Then there was a deafening roar. The pigeons swirled into the air, and all the animals except Napoleon flung themselves flat on their bellies and hid their faces. When they got up again, a huge cloud of black smoke was hanging where the windmill had been. Slowly, the breeze drifted it away. The windmill had ceased to exist. At this sight, the animals' courage returned to them. The fear and despair they had felt a moment earlier were drowned in their rage against this vile, contemptible act. A mighty cry for vengeance went up, and without waiting for further orders, they charged forth in a body and made straight for the enemy. This time they did not heed the cruel pellets that swept over them like hail. It was a savage, bitter battle. The men fired again and again, and when the animals got to close quarters, lashed out with their sticks and their heavy boots. A cow, three sheep, and two geese were killed, and nearly everyone was wounded. Even Napoleon, who was directing operations from the rear, had the tip of his tail chipped by a pellet. But the men did not go unscathed either. Three of them had their heads broken by blows from boxers' hooves. Another was gored in the belly by a cow's horn, Another had his trousers nearly torn off by Jesse and Bluebell, and when the nine dogs of Napoleon's own bodyguard, whom he had instructed to make a duty tour under cover of the hedge, suddenly appeared on the men's flank, being ferociously, panic overtook them. They saw that they were in danger of being surrounded. Frederick shouted to his men to get out while the going was good. In the next moment, the cowardly enemy was running for dear life. The animals chased them right down to the bottom of the field and got in some last kicks at them as they forced their way through the thorn hedge. They had won, but they were weary and bleeding. Slowly, they began to limp back towards the farm. The sight of their dead comrades stretched upon the grass, moved some of them to tears, and for a little while they halted in sorrowful silence at the place where the windmill had once stood. Yes, it was gone. Almost the last trace of their labor was gone. Even the foundations were partially destroyed, and in rebuilding it, they could not, this time as before, make use of the fallen stones. This time the stones had vanished too. The force of this explosion had flung them to distances of hundreds of yards. It was as though the windmill had never been. As they approached the farm, Squealer, who had unaccountably been absent during the fighting, came skipping towards them, whisking his tail and beaming with satisfaction, and the animals heard from the direction of the farm 